shock absorbers, also called as dampers, are long cylindrical things near your wheels that claims to smoothen the ride. Even though most shock absorbers look just the same from outside, there are pretty marvelous technologies hiding inside them. To name a few types of shock absorbers or dampers, there are twin tube and monotube type of shock absorbers. With twin tube, there is also a gas filled shock absorber. Then there is position sensitive damping in both twin tube and monotube setup. Also acceleration sensitive damping in twin tube and monotube setup. Then there is bypass hole type shock absorber, magnetorheological type dampers, etc. In the last video, we have discussed about the types of springs in an automobile suspension. If you haven't checked out that video, make sure to do that. In this second part of the suspension series, let's untangle everything about the modern shock absorber. Springs in a suspension system absorb the bump and again regains its length back to maintain the wheel contact with the road and also to maintain the height of the vehicle. But using springs in suspension is not that simple. It comes with its own drawbacks. One of the main drawback is when the spring is uncompressed suddenly, it vibrates back and forth. So if just springs are used in a suspension, then that won't give a good ride, rather will vibrate you inside. To dampen this vibration or say absorb this shock, we need shock absorbers. The function of shock absorbers is to allow spring compression relatively easily but make expansion tough, just enough that all the energy stored in the spring at compression is used until the spring regains its length back and it doesn't have any extra energy left in it to oscillate back and forth after that. So you won't get a vibration inside. See how much difference it can make. There have been many types of shock absorbers in the history of automobiles, but we'll discuss the relevant ones only. Basic terminology first. When a shock absorber is compressed, it's called compression stroke. And when it regains its length back, it's called rebound stroke. There are single acting and double acting type of shock absorbers. In single acting, compression is easier and rebound is more resistant to regaining the length. In dual acting shock absorbers, both compression and rebound offer resistance to movement. As there is resistance to compression, the suspension becomes stiff. Nowadays, a shock absorber doesn't need to be either single acting or double acting. Most modern shock absorbers have both characteristics well tuned for the situations, where rebound is very resistant to the moment and requires lot of energy, while compression is resistant but relatively very less than rebound. And sometimes compression is only made to be resistant at extreme displacement. You may have seen some suspensions in bikes and motorcycles where you can tune the resistance for compression and rebound separately. So nowadays you can get everything in one. You don't need to choose. Just spend more if you need it. So let's now start understanding the shock absorbers in detail. First, we'll start with a basic twin tube setup. Let's see how it works. This is how a basic twin tube shock absorber looks like. As the name, there are two tubes in it, one in other. The internal one is called as pressure cylinder or pressure tube. It has a piston in it. The piston connects to a rod and that rod has an mounting on the other end. The piston has small valves in it. Some open at compression stroke called compression valves and other open at rebound called as rebound valves. There is also a base valve which has small valves in it, compression valves which open at compression and rebound valves which open at rebound stroke. The outer tube and inner tube form an oil chamber between, so all the excess oil can remain in it. The resistance to compression or rebound is dependent upon the valves of the shock absorber. Generally, the valves which allow fluid flow at compression have bigger openings, so fluid flow is easier offering less resistance, while flow to rebound is made difficult by having less number of valves or valves with smaller openings, which allow better damping of the spring vibration. Now let's see how a shock absorber works. When you hit a bump on a road, the spring compresses and the shock absorber also gets compressed. While compression, the piston gets pushed like this. Some of the oil in this part of the pressure chamber gets through these compression valves and get into the other side of the pressure chamber. 
As this rod is also entering the chamber, it consumes some space. Hence, all oil moving from here cannot be accommodated in this area. So, some of it gets pushed in the oil chamber through the brace valves, as the compression valves in the base valves open. When the spring tries to regain its length back at rebound stroke, the piston is forced to move back. This time though, the compression valves gets closed, and now the oil has to flow back in this chamber through the rebound valves. The rebound valves of piston and base valves are smaller. It requires more effort to discharge large amount of oil quickly. Hence spring spends all of its energy to regain its length. So the spring has no excess energy left in it to oscillate back and forth once it regains its length back. Damping the shocks. See this in effect. There is one major drawback of a simple twin tube shock absorber. In off-road conditions, when there is repetitive reciprocation of the piston, oil foaming means hydraulic aeration happens. In layman's language, bubbles form in the cylinder. That makes the damping characteristics of the shock absorber inconsistent. To mitigate this problem comes a gas-filled shock absorber. A gas-filled shock absorber in twin tube setup is pretty simple. It's just a twin tube setup where high pressure nitrogen gas is filled in this region. So when the oil flows in the chamber at compression, occupying some space in the chamber, the gas gets compressed further. At rebound, the pressurized gas pushes back the oil in the pressure cylinder. This ensures that the pressure cylinder is always full of oil and there is no room for bubbles to form. There are additional effects of using a gas charge shock absorber. When the piston displaces a longer distance, the oil chambers fill up at higher level, compressing the gas even more. Now, more the piston wants to displace, more force it has to put on gas to compress it. This increases the stiffness of the suspension at extreme compression, which offers better handling characteristics as the suspension becomes stiffer. Also, the pressurized gas pushes the oil at rebound, which helps the spring to regain its length quicker at longer displacement, so shock absorbers are always ready for the next pump. One thing to note here is that the help offered by the pressurized gas at rebound is not so much that it ruins the damping effect. This help is only significant at extreme displacement range of the piston, as only at that time the pressure of the gas is high enough to provide any sufficient help. For any displacement less than that, the gas pressure is not enough to offer notable help. Next is PSD, means position sensitive damping. In position sensitive damping, a part of piston travel is less resistant to moment, so it is called comfort zone. And the piston travel in other regions has higher resistance to moment, doing most of the damping work. It is called as control zone. Construction wise, there are two main types of making a PSD. One is by making grooves in the pressure cylinder, where you can make many zones along with transition zones. And other way is by making bypass holes. Let's see how the version with grooves work. The pressure cylinder has grooves on the walls for some length. When the piston is in this region, it doesn't seal off with the walls, allowing the oil to flow through the grooves, easing the travel. For anything above the grooves, the piston seals with the walls and separates these portions well, so piston travel becomes resistant. At compression, there is little resistance in this region. Then in this region with grooves, oil gets more ways to travel through the grooves, so resistance lowers, even more. Then there is again the region with no grooves, so the resistance increases slightly. Then for the rebound stroke, when the piston is in this region, the piston faces lot of resistance to travel back as oil has only these valves to allow oil flow. As it comes to this region, the oil can also flow from the grooves, so there is less resistance. So rebounding in this region becomes quicker and requires less energy. Then in this region, the rebound becomes more resistant as the piston seals off with the walls better and there are no grooves to further help the oil flow. So for small jerks and heavy compression, the vehicle shock absorbers are in control zone offering better drivability and better control on the vehicle. For anything in between, shock absorbers offer a comfortable ride due to quick adjustment. Thanks to the grooves, this is how compression and rebound stroke for a PSD looks like. 
By tapering the grooves or decreasing the number of grooves or positioning the grooves at different places, different tunings of PSD can be obtained. Next is ASD, means acceleration sensitive damping. Acceleration here refers to acceleration of the piston in the pressure chamber and not to the acceleration of the vehicle. And ASD offers resistance to compression as well as rebound, while resistance to compression becomes lower when the piston accelerates faster in the pressure chamber. When a vehicle approaches a bump or pothole slowly, the piston doesn't accelerate fast enough, so the compression remains resistant, giving stiff character to the suspension and giving better handling characteristics to your car. And for any instant and heavy shocks, when the piston accelerates faster, the compression strokes become very less resistant to the compression, so the piston travel becomes quicker and easier, absorbing the shock better and offers comfortable ride. So an ASD has stiff as well as soft character when required. Let's see the tech behind it. In ASD, the piston has an extra spring-loaded valve that opens only when the piston is at high acceleration due to compression. This acceleration-sensitive valve has holes in it for fluid flow during compression. But these holes are blocked by spring-loaded plate. At lower piston speed, all this assembly moves together, keeping these holes closed. So when the vehicle approaches a bump or pothole slowly, the piston doesn't accelerate fast enough to open the valve, so the oil passes through these regular compression valves. These regular compression valves in ASD shock absorber are made smaller, offering more resistance, giving suspension stiffness as well as better handling to the car. When the vehicle approaches a bump or pothole instantaneously at high speed, the piston wants to compress quickly to absorb the shock, but these small valves cannot allow so much oil to transfer quickly. At such time, ASD valve opens. At higher piston acceleration during compression, the piston moves further quickly. But this plate wants to be at its position due to inertia. The inertia overpowers the spring, making space between the plate and the holes, which allow the fluid to flow through these holes. So the oil flow becomes quicker and less resistant than that of at normal compression, hence making the suspension softer and absorbing the bump quicker. Then as the acceleration goes down, the valve again closes back and it functions as a normal suspension. Now let's talk about monotube shock absorbers. Monotube shock absorbers have similar working principle as twin tube shock absorbers, but with better oil and gas separation with simpler assembly. Here's how a simple monotube shock absorber looks like. There's just one tube in which there is a piston with compression and rebound valves. Then there is a separator in the tube, one side of which is filled with oil and other is filled with pressurized nitrogen gas. The separator prevents mixing of both. There is no base valve in monotube shock absorber. At compression, the piston travels down and some of the oil passes through the compression valve. All of the oil cannot be accommodated at the back of the piston as rod consumes some space. So some oil pushes on this separator compressing the gas even more and making some space for itself. At rebound, the piston travels back. The rebound valves allow the flow of oil with resistance. Simultaneously, the gas also pushes back on the oil to release its pressure. This ensures that there is no foaming effect of oil and there is consistent performance even on worst and frequent bumps. The shock absorbers also have a better response rates than a dual tube shock absorber. A monotube shock absorber can also be made to be a PSD by adding grooves like this and can also be made as ASD by putting ASD valve in the piston. Have a look at this monotube shock absorber. Do you find any flaw? Before I tell you that, make sure you subscribe our channel if you haven't yet. Also if you have any questions, feel free to mention them down in the comment section. We also have a Facebook and Instagram page, make sure to follow that too. Okay, so now let's get back to the flaw. So, as you can see, the piston stroke is much smaller, but the length of the absorber is much longer, cause of the gas chamber. This more consumption of linear space isn't ideal in many conditions, especially in the rear shocks of a two-wheeler. So there's one modification done to it. This is a split monotube shock absorber. The piston travels in this space and displaces the extra oil through this path. Then on this section, there is oil chamber, separator and gas fill section. The working is just the same.
Now let's see a bypass type of position sensitive damping. This is a sort of both twin tube and monotube setup. Here the pressure cylinder has holes that bypass the oil from one side of the piston to the other. At rebound, initially it's quite resistant, then further here the oil gets bypassed like this which makes it softer, then again it becomes more resistant due to lack of bypass. By changing the size of holes, the bypass resistance can be decided. Also by changing the position and distance between the holes, the control and comfort zones can be decided. Lastly, let's talk about magnetorheological dampers. Rheology means viscosity. In magnetorheological damper, the viscosity of the oil is adjusted so that the flow resistance can be adjusted to tune the suspension in real time. This is how effective it could be. In magnetorheological suspension, the suspension can be tuned in any setting you want or in real time. It can be stiff or soft, acceleration sensitive or position sensitive and it can also have many zones in position sensitive setting. So it can be everything of everything you want. Here's how it works. This is a magnetorheological fluid which is basically an oil with fine iron particles. By applying magnetism, the iron particles bond with each other, increasing the viscosity. More the magnetic force you apply, more viscous the fluid gets. So the fluid flow through these piston valves can be as simple as water or as difficult as ketchup or peanut butter. Here is the assembly of a magnetorheological suspension. It's pretty similar to a monotube shock absorber with a modified piston. The piston has electromagnetic coils which when activated change the rheology means the viscosity of the oil, varying the resistance to travel the piston. Technically, there is no need of separate valves for compression and rebound. At compression, the magnetism can be deactivated or lowered to ease the flow and at rebound, the oil can be magnetized to increase the viscosity, hence increasing the resistance. Generally, the cars using magnetorheological suspension also have radars in the front of the car. So it maps the road in front of you and automatically adjusts the suspension to get best out of it. That's all about a modern shock absorber. Hope it helps you to make the decision on what fit best to your needs. In the next video, we'll be talking about suspension assembly types. So make sure you subscribe the channel and hit the notification bell to get notified for the future update. As of for now, I'm signing off. See you guys in the next one.